Well, hello everyone. This is Todd Classy, and this is my podcast, the Making Photos Live podcast, broadcasting live from the cold state of Montana, where, quite frankly, I think I joined most of the kind people of Montana, and we're hoping, praying, that spring comes soon. Uh, as you know, many of you know, I spent a lot of time photographing in the world of agriculture, and uh, this is about the week that a lot of photographers, uh, our pardon me, ranchers, are going to begin calving, which means that their cattle are going to give birth to hundreds on some ranches, thousands in some counties, and millions of calves across the state of Montana. And if it doesn't warm up soon, this is going to be a pretty rough season for the ranchers. So for those of you who have tuned in the last few weeks, hi Terry, hi Quincy, uh, I'm changing the format around a little bit. Uh, it'll really come into its being next week. I got a few gizmos and gadgets and uh, tweaks coming that'll schnaz things up a bit, make things seem a little more professional. Uh, until then, I'm going to be bouncing off the portions of the new format on you. I started listening to my, last, my first two podcasts, and frankly, I was bored. And if I am bored listening to myself talk, then I'm sure most of you are. So I'm going to try to make things a little more snappy. I'm not going to spend time. I will spend time editing photos and going over that with you. Um, but I'm not going to try to main, maintain a stream of consciousness while I do so because I lose my train of thought. I'm not interesting. And so we're going to do things just a little bit differently. Um, this time around. The way I'm going to start it out, I'm going to break it into four groups. Uh, I have to try to keep an eye on the clock so we can keep things under an hour, I hope. Uh, the first segment, I'm going to talk about just something going on in photography, but I'll have visuals so it won't be so boring. And of course, I'll be on, on the screen as well here soon, starting next week. My studio is almost done. Um, my new microphone is really came out of the box and things aren't working on it. So I have a new one coming in. Uh, I've got my studio set almost done. The lighting's not perfect. It's nothing fancy, but just professional and a few other things that are going on. But uh, the first segment I'm going to spend talking about just general photography, some thoughts on that. I'll spend 10, 15 minutes talking about that. Then my next segment, um, we're going to uh, spend some time uh, going through uh, some photo stories, some photos I've taken. People seem to really like that last week. And so I'll pull up a photo, two or three, and go through them and tell you the story behind the photos. Um, for those of you who are photographers, I can tell you, you know, how I took the photos, what the settings were, that sort of thing, but also tell you what was going on at the time. Uh, the third segment I'm going to go through, we're going to call uh, r slash photo critique. r slash, for those of you who are unfamiliar, comes from uh, Reddit. It's an online community. Um, there they have a... a group called photo critique it's a group that i've very nearly been thrown out of three or four times because <laughs> i i can be a little bit of a, a little bit of a smart ass so <laughs> instead of getting thrown out of our photo critique over there i've asked the people over there if i could bring the photos anonymously onto my podcast of course once they find out how harsh i can be sometimes who knows they may very well stop that from happening so i'll have to come up with a back a backup segment and then we're going to do something really exciting because you know it's what 2019 and everybody gets letters right we're going to have a letter segment segment and it's basically i think it's going to be called um help i need some photoshop and i think the bumper i'm going to use for it is going to be to the tune of help from the beatles we'll see i haven't worked that out quite yet i'm still working on that i've got a singer who will hopefully help me with that, and I'll hopefully have that for you next week. So to get underway, uh, for those of you who are into photography, and I hope most of you are, I thought one of the cool segments I would go into is talk about accessories. Everybody in the world of photography loves accessories, and I can tell you that in the 18 years that I've been making photographs, I have wasted literally thousands and thousands of dollars on accessories because I thought they looked cool, um, because I'm a techno geek and because I thought they would benefit my photography only to find out 90% of them are pure trash. So I thought I would go through the must have ones. A few of these are surprises for those of you who do photography. I suspect that you're familiar with some of them and it doesn't matter if you're shooting uh, with a DSLR or a compact camera 
or even just a cell phone. These will apply mostly, not entirely, but mostly across the board. I also want to take a time and say hello to Sunny, the wonderful Sunny. Uh, Sunny and I go back about three years. I appreciate her stopping by. Chris Wake. Um, Chris Wake says she's never been bored listening to me. I find that hard to believe, but I'll take the compliment. Kathy Rebuilds. I've known Kathy for about a year. Thank you, Kathy, for stopping by. Uh, and uh, Quincy. No, Quincy, I don't use Lightroom in part because I started using uh, Photoshop uh, first. And making the transition over to Lightroom wasn't easy for me. Um, but it is on my bucket list this year to learn how to use Lightroom as a backup just in case and also help family and friends with with uh, using that software. And, of course, all of you too at some point. But I am, I am hardly a pro with Lightroom. But when it comes to Photoshop, I'm pretty good. So I consider these the 10 most important accessories you can get. Most of them are very inexpensive. One of them, not so much. Um, but I think it's worthwhile, and I'll tell you why. The first one is something called the Geodos Rocket Air Blaster. Now, there's a few knockoffs out there, like everything in the world, but this is the original Rocket Blaster. Um, it's made in America. Uh, I would highly encourage this. is probably the first thing I would buy if I was starting over from scratch. And, you know, in my world where I'm photographing a lot in the West, on ranches, on farms, in national parks, in fields, you know, my lenses get dusty all the time. Now, granted, my camera is pretty much weather sealed, but when you get dust on the front element of the lens, it has an inch, especially on, on, on zoom lenses, it finds its way into the lens, finds its way into the sensor and the body of the camera. And so I'm always using this when I'm changing lenses. I'll, you know, squeeze air onto the top element of the lens. And then when I take the lens off, I'll squeeze inside the lens. Um, away from the camera uh, to uh, keep dust from getting inside the camera and to keep the front element clear. So as far as as far as far accessories are, and by the way, all these accessories, if you check in the body of tonight's podcast, I have links to every one of these accessories on Amazon. So go ahead and you can check those out if you want and save them for later or whatever. Um, but this is, this is, I consider one of the best accessories and the most important ones I would ever buy. Another one that people forget to get is a circular polarizer filter. Now, most, most photographers, especially amateurs, will go out and they'll buy what, what's called a UV filter. Basically, all it is is a, a clear piece of glass that's supposed to keep UV rays out, and it does anything but. I've never used a U well, I can't say never, but in the last 17 years, I've never used, I, I haven't used a UV filter on any of my lenses. I'd rather go without a filter on my lenses because, you know, I spend lots of money on these expensive lenses. And in case you don't know, lenses make a photograph, cameras don't. Lenses are much more important to making a sharp photo. So the more you spend on the lens, generally speaking, the better the quality the photograph will be. And when you put a piece of cheap glass on front of an expensive piece of glass, like on a lens, it never makes much sense to me because I know that it degrades the quality of the photos. Not only that, depending on the angle of your lens, sun can get inside between your filter and the top element of your lens, and it can bounce around, and it can create bad effects. And I don't like that either. But I do use, I take it on and off, a circular polarizer. Why is this valuable? For those who don't know, a polarizer um, works when you are 90 degrees from the sun. So at sunrise, sunset, and high noon, it's one that is most valuable. It's less valuable on wide-angle lenses. And what it'll do is it'll make the blues in your sky very blue. And it'll make the whites very white. So if you think of a sky and a bit with lots of fluffy clouds, if you're shoot, doing a lot of shooting outside, um, if you put a circular polarizer in your lens for landscape shots, you got to have a polarizer it's, uh, on your camera because it's the one thing that quite frankly, Photoshop has a hard time mimicking. Um, so if you want very beautiful landscapes, um, it's also what you want to use. Also, if you're shooting through windows, like say through shops, you can take care of the take remove the glare that comes from the sun and, and light, and a polarizer will also do that. Or uh, removing the rays and the um, 
uh, what do you want to say, the, the reflections that you see on rivers or bodies of water. So you can actually see the fish uh, inside of a body of water. I, don't, I use it mostly for pop, making my skies pop. Um, and if I get into a situation where I'm worried about my lens being damaged, then I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just put the circular polarizer on. Um, but typically speaking, and by the way, you can get these for cell phones. You can get these for, for uh, um, point and shoot compact cameras. Um, so I highly encourage you um, to, uh, you know, think about getting one of these if you want to improve the quality of your photographs. Now, again, it works when you're in 90 degree angles from the sun. So when the sun first comes up or when it goes down, think about it. If you're shooting something that's, you know, straight up and, you know, looking up with the, with the lens or if you're angled, you know, your camera's pointing 90 degrees from the sun, you'll get beautiful blue skies. When the sun is at high noon, and that's when it's one of the worst times to make photographs because the sun will blanch out a lot of the colors and the contrast in a photo, you can go a full 360 degrees and make the skies look better than they would normally at that time of day. So that's the best time to use it. Um, if it's, you know, the sun's at, at, at between sunrise and noon or between noon and sunset, they don't work as well. Um, but again, if you're a good photographer and you enjoy photography, you know to make photographs early in the morning. You know to make photographs late in the day. And you know in the middle of the day you tend to shy away from making photos. But this little gadget will help. Of course, everybody needs memory cards. You know, everybody says they have a budget. You know, they'll come to me and say, listen, I have $500 to spend. I got $1,000 to spend. I got $2,000, 3000 to spend. What do I get? You can't forget memory cards. Um, and a lot of amateur photographers, they store all their photos on their memory cards, which to me doesn't make any sense. Because if they're on your camera, you can't analyze them, you can't see them large, you can't print them easily. And so, you know, I advise having as many memory cards as you can. The brand I use is Lexar. I used to use another popular brand that's out there. I don't use them anymore because I had some problems with them and availability was a premium. Lexar almost sold its memory card division, but they there was such a protest that they got back into it. Um, my camera uses compact flash cards. Um, a lot of other consumer cameras use um, SD cards. They also make SD cards. And of course, you know, you have micro SD cards for things like cell phones. So on cell phones in particular, get as large a, you know, a card as you can get. Um, and, but then also remember to remove the photos from your camera, back them up onto a computer or hard drive. And actually take a look at the information on each photograph. You know, what was your aperture setting? What was your shutter speed? And just looking at that information on a photo, especially one that you like, will you help you, you know, teach yourself how to you know, take better photos down the road. Don't forget a battery. Always have a battery or two. Frankly, I, I leave when I leave the house for a shoot, I have probably have eight of them inside my camera bags. Do I go through all eight? No, that's a, that's a holdover from years ago when batteries didn't last as long. But sometimes I might forget to charge one, and I'm glad I had those extras with me. So, you know, just make sure when you buy any new camera that you get a spare battery. Also, resale value is important for cameras and for lenses. Um, what I do when I buy a new camera or, or lens, I don't throw away the box. And I never submit the warranty card. And I never throw away the packaging. I never throw away the little tie wraps. I keep it and I store it in a closet because I know one day I'll upgrade. And when I do, and I tell people that my camera or my lens has, has the original box, undamaged, has the original manual, unused, because you can read them online, you know, has the original packaging, and has an unsubmitted warranty card, which means if they fill it out, they can get a full warranty. I can add 10 and sometimes up to 25% of the cost of my product as I sell it on eBay. So you know, keep that in mind. But the other thing you want to do is to protect your rear LCD optical, optical screen with a, with a protector. Uh, make sure it's large enough. Uh, put it on there. When you're done, when you sell it, just peel it off. And you shouldn't have any scratches on your rear LCD screen. Um, Shamo, nice to see you. Uh, and Kathy, we'll have a few more photos to go through here a little bit later, too, with some stories. 
there's another thing called a lens pen you don't want to use your fingers never use your fingers to touch or your shirt <laughs> to clean a lens um, you want to use the rocket blower first um, and the second thing I recommend using is a lens pen a lens pen um, has a, a bit of graphite tip to it and you take it and you in a circular fashion you start in the middle and you go into a big conical shape where you start going wider and wider with your circles until it goes to the edges and then when you're done you take a microfiber cloth and you sweep away any residue that's on your lens and so if you're getting smudge marks which can happen um, especially when you don't use a UV filter like me um, the lens pen is a great way for keeping your front element of your lens nice crisp and clean um, and then of course you do need microfiber cleaning cloths um, I'm not a big fan of them because uh, they get lost and they get dirty and I have to go through so many of them on a regular basis um, but you got to have them there's nothing else that for cleaning your lenses that work better than you know microfiber um, cleaning cloths and of course any brand there typically would do um, if you want to get into serious landscape photography if you want to get into um, you know creative photography if that's what you enjoy then you got to get a tripod you absolutely need to get a tripod because there are times when it's just too dark for you to hold the camera without it blurring and of course you can do a lot of interesting effects um, like high definition range photography uh, and several other techniques that you can use if you have a tripod um, and even if it is nice and sunny outside you know, if you're doing landscape photography where Christmas and detail is important a tripod comes in handy now I will tell you this when you buy a tripod the cheap ones are rubbish they're, they're just horrible they don't work um, the more you spend on a tripod I'm sorry to say the better it's gonna hold uh, it's gonna maintain a, a steady image shot um, when you, ma you make a photo now there are ways of getting around that of course you can set it like on a picnic table or you can set it and stuff and that will work too um, but if you're in, serious about photography do yourself a favor this is the one accessory I, I, I encourage you to splurge on go get yourself a nice tripod I'm a big fan of the Manfrotto line I use a I get a carbon fiber tri, uh, tripod which costs a little bit more um, but it's lighter to carry and on this particular one here if you'll notice on the the bottom end of this rod there's a hook and you can and you can attach your camera bag to it which makes your tripod in heavy wind conditions even sturdier so um, I'm just a big fan of the Manfrotto tripod and then here you'll notice this one doesn't come with a head you're gonna have to search and figure out you know what kind of head you want to use if you're doing more video than still images then you're gonna want a video head if you're doing landscape photography then you're gonna want a different kind of head than other ones I like to use a pistol grip um, head just you know you have to do some research and just figure out which one that you you, you like more here's a weird one I encourage you all if you have lenses and a DSLR to go get yourself from Amazon Prime a jar of classical traditional sweet basil tomato sauce now you're wondering what here's why if you shop through Amazon Prime a prime pantry pardon me and you've ever purchased something like this through them they will ship it to you in this interesting bubble pack that wrapped with a rubber band that's filled with air to prevent this from damaging during shipment it comes free well I'm not sure it's free. I'm sure it's calculated in the price but guess what it's roughly the size of most of my lenses and you know I don't know of anything that's on the market that's as cheap and does a better job of protecting my lenses in my camera bag than the packaging that comes when you buy a jar of tomato sauce from Amazon it's a, it's the greatest thing in the world and I've saved these and I have them stored in a closet um, I have backups in case they ever get damaged and sometimes they do but it doesn't matter because they don't cost a thing um, and then you get a free jar of <laughs> tomato sauce with it when you make your purchase so check out if you if you order through Amazon Prime some of you probably know what I'm talking about if you haven't uh, you may not uh, but I'm telling you that the bubble wrapping that comes with through Amazon not through Walmart Walmart's is very poor by comparison uh, but the what stuff you get through Amazon is perfect for protecting lenses 
and other gear in your camera bag. And of course, the most important thing you can get is photo editing software. Um, it's the one thing you can get that will improve your photography dramatically. I recommend getting the Photoshop, the Adobe Photoshop and Lightroom Photography Plan. It costs $10 a month. With it, you get Adobe Bridge, you get a Photoshop, you get Lightroom, you get all the software you need to have a digital darkroom on your computer. If that's too much for you, then I encourage you to go get a copy of Photoshop Elements, which costs like $100. It has doesn't have nearly the number of features that Photoshop has, but it works exactly the same way. So if you ever make the leap to Photoshop or Lightroom, you'll know where everything is. And the transition is super easy. So even if you're just an amateur photographer and you're making photos of just family members, Photoshop Elements or the, or the Photoshop Photography Plan is wonderful. It's a great tool, and I, I swear by it. So that concludes that segment. I'm about five minutes over. Next thing we're going to get into r slash photo critique. And I'm going to go through these until the bottom of the hour, some photos that uh, come up on Reddit. And they ask people for serious commentary. And I will provide my serious commentary on some amateur photographs. Some of these are, will be brutal, but they're meant in jest. I hope you have a sense of humor. If you don't, I apologize in advance. Um, this is the first one I came up, and it was t uh, on the header. It came up with the header, first attempt at a portrait. How do I improve? My first reaction was, uh, don't make any more portraits. No, I'm kidding, of course. Um, actually, the one thing this photographer did that was excellent was use the light from a window to illuminate the dog. The only problem is, is that uh, because of the camera settings, it was probably shot in, in automatic mode as most amateurs use, which is the wrong thing to do. Um, it left the right side of the dog's face, right side as you're facing it, too dark. Um, this is where Photoshop would help. It would help you open up the shadows here on the right side. The other problem is, is that with most photography, we tend not to get close enough. Um, it's hard not to, to be too close when you're making a portrait. One of the reasons is because you have all these leaves in the background you know, photography is a lot about backgrounds and choosing good backgrounds. Photographs that have good backgrounds make good photos. Here, it's not such a good photograph, not, not such a good background because look, you have this leaf that's sprouting out of the dog's head. That's not good. You also have this broken leaf on the side here, which kind of distracts the eyes. So a tighter crop in here and using some Photoshop maybe to take out this leaf or better yet, it's a lot easier where you don't need photo software. Go back and move this planter or move this leaf so it's not growing out of the poor dog's head. Photoshop will also help with improving the eyes. The eyes are the window to the soul. And here you could make these eyes look a little bit better, a little bit more penetrating, which would make the dog interesting. And you can cl clean up a few specks as well, like this errant hair on the dog's nose and a few other specks down here and a few other whiskers. Um, and that would improve the photograph as well. This one came up with the headline, Learning photography is my hobby. Would love some critiques. This isn't bad, uh, but it's a typical easy shot that uh, every early photographer makes, and it's a silhouette. Silhouettes are a dime a dozen. You know, what you basically do is you meter off the sky, and you properly compose the sky, and then you'll see that everything else is basically dark, except for here, in, a, in this case, is a body of water. Of course, it helps. I'm not sure where this one was photographed, but it helps it was photographed in a very beautiful location as well. Um, now, what I would have done is waited until the lights came on, even if it meant the sun was going to dip behind the horizon. This is where a tripod comes in handy. Take the shot now if you like the sky the way it is. Wait for the sun to dip behind the horizon without ever moving your camera. Make a shot when the lights come on. Blend the two images in Photoshop, and then you've got yourself a killer shot. This one came with a headline. A sunset photo. I'm an amateur. Any feedback, suggestion is appreciated. Well, first thing, turn off your stupid date thing on your <laughs> on your camera. All right. Uh, little do you realize um, 
Every photograph has its date stored on it. It doesn't need to be in the photograph. You can get free software online where if you go look at the file information and you look at the camera data. Now, see, this one was stripped because he used it in Photoshop. But if you go in here, you'll see they'll tell you the make of the camera, the model, the owner. They'll tell you when it was taken, all that wonderful jazzy information. This one was stripped because um, websites tend to strip that information. But you don't need to have this on your photograph. Does it really matter? If you're trying to make beautiful photographs, this is the dumbest thing you can do. Here you can also see you have an antenna or something that's sticking off on the side. You can also see that um, it's probably overcropped because you're starting to get some noise here in the shadows. You cut off these boats, which looks like they have you know, are going to sink because you cut them off. Um, it's just not a very interesting or inspiring photograph. This came with a headline, any tips on how to begin with street photography? Well, if you're familiar with street photography, the first thing I would do is start by not cutting off this poor guy's feet. Um, second thing I would do is, and this is a byproduct of cheaper lenses, you can, this background is very distracting. If you have a lens with a, a very large aperture, you can blur the background more, which puts the center of focus on this man. And I'm sorry, but if you're doing street photography, you got to be a lot closer than this. In fact, it's bet this is this gentleman here used a, a telephoto lens. You want to use a, generally speaking, a wide-angle lens and be super close. Wide-angle lenses mean you can be standing right next to this guy and you can be aiming off to the right. He won't even know that your that your camera can pick up his pick up him in the in the photograph. And that's how you can sneak good street photography photos. This one was, I have my first photography college critique tomorrow. Thoughts? <laughs> my first response was, fire your professor. <laughs> you know, a lot, of, a lot of photography is about subject and why he thought a cigarette put out in a glass of wine, spent a glass of wine, um, I guess I don't know. Um, I, I don't, again, I don't get it. Sometimes, you know, photographers, amateurs who are trying to be cute, overthink things. I do it too. Um, it's worth experimenting, but it's not something I would ever submit to a college professor for review. Of course, I can tell you a lot of college professors aren't that bright either. Um, in fact, the college in the town where I live, they still teach only analog photography they don't teach digital, and I pissed him off about a year or two ago when I was with a friend who was his boss, um, and he asked me, you know, what he thought about, you know, their, you know, helping out with the college program, and I, I told him point blank. I thanked him for teaching analog, and he said, "Why?" He says, "Because I don't have to worry about any of your students ever competing against me." I mean, analog is great for art photography, but for making money. <laughs> Making a living, it's it's the worst thing in the world. This is just a, I mean, it's just a stupid subject. And frankly, subject is a lot of making good photos. This one came with the headline, self-portrait. I, again, I don't know what this person's thinking. First of all, horizons are important. Now, you don't think there's a horizon here when you're doing a close-up on a dirty face. Um, but the eye here is lower than this eye. And the human... The way the human mind works, I read a lot about psychology. Humans look, when we look for partners, there are things that we look for instinctively that we don't know that we're doing. One of them has to do with separation of eyes, has to do with you know the distance of eyes, has to do with the size of eyes, has to do with the size of pupils. All these things come into play. And when your head, your, your head seems straight, but your eyes seem tilted like this, the mind instinctively thinks, you know, what's wrong with this person? And, and the fact that he would take the time to put his watermark on this photo, hoping no one would steal it, I can't even begin to think what was going through his head. This one came with the head, this headline, tell me how I can improve this picture. This actually isn't a bad photograph. But when you look at a photograph, the first thing you should be looking at is what distracts you. First thing that distracts me is this motorcycle. So I can probably guess that somebody's holding up this dog. So put the dog down. Go move the damn motorcycle. 
and put them back up there again. The second thing that would benefit is, again, if you have Photoshop, I would remove this, I would remove this, I would remove this, and whatever this is, probably part of a lamppost, I'm guessing, and then this thing in the background, I would remove that. And then you could also open up the color in the dog's eyes. Otherwise, it's not a horrible photograph, to be honest with you. It's just that this motorcycle bugs the hell out of me. This came with the headline. So I took this picture with my iPhone. I'm trying to start in the world of photography. What do you think? Uh, my response to this was, stop. This one was inspired, had the headline, inspired by the Feels Like Summer music <laughs> video. What do you think? Uh, this, professional photographers have a saying. I didn't come up with it. And by the way, I violate this rule too. But if you have to colorize a photograph, it's probably a bad photograph to begin with. So, you know, stick to the basics. Learn how to make a basic photograph without having to turn it into goofy colors. And then you'll be doing much better. I, I wasn't going to include this one, um, but I thought I would. The one on the headline was this, how would you improve these maternity photos? Well, first of all, again, your background is horrible. But the second thing, this guy is a pretty big guy, and I can say this because I'm no small potato myself. I would have him standing in front and have her holding his gut. I think it would make a more interesting photograph. I'm just saying. And here, look at this. you got this beautiful green background back here. Why are you taking these with these steps? I, it makes no sense to me. None. None whatsoever. I don't get it. Uh, and then your legs are... I, I don't know. Here's what people... A common mistake is they don't get close enough or they don't get far, back far enough. So they're not back far enough so the legs are cut off. And then you see this like, like where did this shoe come from? I mean, the leg comes down and goes back. This leg goes down. Oh, it must be his shoe. Okay, the first thing I do is get rid of that shoe. But still, I was wondering how this, how her leg sprouted a third shoe, but whatever. This one, this is exactly how it was seen, by the way. It said, uh, uh, first post here, miss focus on the peppers, but what are your other thoughts? <laughs> and I, I typed, um, Make sure you mount your, your grill to the ground and not the wall of your house, for starters, because I'm really worried about the coals and these peppers sliding off the grill. You can see they're right on the edge. Um, and the other thing, when you completely miss the focus where this is, these are blurry and your flame is blurry, and then you got this distracting background, well, you know, just, you know, there's no sense in using it sharing it you, you've you failed there's just nothing you can do here's one uh try changing some settings to make the clouds pop more <laughs> any tips <laughs> uh i don't know what to say again here you got a silhouette but this this is i mean is this something you're going to hang on your wall uh no i don't think so um I don't know what to say. I wish I could think of something clever here. I didn't even know how to respond to that one. This one, I, I admire this guy because he had the headline, Critique Me Into the Ground. Okay, I will. Number one, nobody buys square photos. Now, sometimes you can frame them, but this means you're hiding something. Use your damn feet. Get closer. Is this somebody you know? If you don't know them, then you're kind of a creeper. Okay, then get a longer lens if, this, if that's your thing. If you want to photograph joggers in the middle of the night, then get a longer lens, which means also having a tripod. Also, your exposure is all wrong. You got buildings and stuff here in the background. It just it seems creepy. It's like this is the photograph that accompanies a, a investigator when they're going through your house and they're looking for who, you know, is the stalker and the murderer on some path in New York City. So I just there's nothing about this that to me is enticing. Um, the exposure is all wrong. The composition is all wrong. Well, it's not. The composition isn't all wrong, but it's not good. You either you got to get closer with your feet, or you got to get closer with the lens. 
It's just not a very compelling photograph. This one had the headline, My attempt to save this picture. <laughs> you failed. Any critiques? Yeah, don't put your watermark on a photograph that nobody's going to steal. This one, incredibly unplanned picture. My response was, no shit. Uh, looking for t critics, please. Severe ones if possible. I'm actually going to go gentle on this guy because I hear he was trying. Now, you can see there's a halo around this guy's body. And it's he used, he used Photoshop here, clearly, um, because this background colorization thing is just horrible. Um, but it looks like him sitting here. He's got a bird he just farted out of his rear end. You also see there's something sticking off to the side that either he should have removed by moving a few inches to the left or using Photoshop to remove. You've got something laying here on whatever it is he's sitting on, which needs to be removed. And then what the hell is this block? I mean, there's just nothing about this. And, and again, just use the natural colors. This isn't a bad silhouette. You can tell what this is. But this colorization is orange. This doesn't exist in normal life. So... Again, that's why it doesn't work. This one, is the subject clear? My response was, quit humble bragging. It's a good photograph. Shut the fuck up. This one, up in the sky. I took this photo on an overcast day. What should I change? Pick a better day. And this one, my first roll of film. <laughs> and my response was, I hope it's your last. <laughs> now, that's mean. This is typical. Your camera metered off the background because it's bright, which means you backlit your subject, which means you can't tell what's in the foreground. So this was made with using analog film. If you use a digital camera and you set your camera to shoot raw instead of JPEG, you could open up the shadows in here and you could make this a much more pleasing photograph. And here, where it's too bright, you could dial down the exposure here and make that seem not as bright. And if you think that's cheating, um, if you're familiar with the photographer Ansel Adams, everything I described that you can do to this photograph are exactly what he did to every single one of his prints in the analog world. He just used a different way of doing it. He didn't use a computer. He used a developer. He used paddles. He used paper. He used scissors. And he accomplishes the exact same thing that we use in Photoshop. So now we're on to my next segment, which is the photo stories. I'll go through a couple of these real quick. Um, this was, was kind of popular last week. And again, next week I'll have a little bumper thing that will introduce this. It's not just me going walking right into it. Um, let's see, where are we? Making photos intro screen behind the lens. So I am going to pull up something here to see if I can. Yep, you're seeing it just fine and you're hearing me, whereas last week you couldn't hear me at first. This is a photograph that was taken on a very cold day. Uh, at this time, it was approximately minus 37. I got up early in the morning in Haver, Montana. Uh, it was 2 o'clock. I wanted to go to Glacier National Park, which was a three-hour drive. I wanted to get there before the sun came up. I looked at the thermometer, and I thought it said 11 degrees when I left the house. And when I stepped outside, I was like, wow, it's really cold. I better get my long underwear. And when I pulled into a place called Cut Bank, Montana, I uh, got out of the car to get gas because it's the last place you can get gas, even though it's like an hour away from uh, hour away from Glacier National Park, um, I said, geez, it's way cold outside. I, what the hell's going on? And I went inside, and he told me it was minus 45. Now, I would have never went on a three-hour trek across very remote Montana if I'd known it was minus 45 degrees. I never would have. But there's something about the cold days that produces very amazing photographs. I don't know what it is. I can't tell you. I've never actually even researched it. On this particular day, I was returning. It was at the end of the day. It was the last, I don't know, 30 minutes of sunlight. You can tell by the shadows. Here there are long shadows here with the grass. 
And there's this old grain elevator, which sadly was torn down two years ago. And in the distance, you can see a little hill that rises up like a little tiny volcano. That's the Sweetgrass Hills. The Sweetgrass Hills are a portion of Montana where the Canadians used to come through on horseback with uh, bottles of uh, Canadian whiskey during Prohibition um, to come into the United States um, with their alcohol wares to distribute across the country. They came right through this little tiny town called Lothair, which has a population of about eight, I'm guessing. Anyhow, I got out of the truck and I said, okay, I don't need my gloves. It's just going to be a quick shot. And I walked across U.S. Highway 2, which generally is pretty busy, but on the cold days like this, it's, I mean, when I say busy <laughs> by Montana standards, that means you see about a car every two minutes. Uh, but on this particular day, there weren't many cars on the highway. And I walked over at what looked like firm ground, and it was a huge ditch. And I went all the way down to my neck. And I was on my knees, and I took this shot um, inside the ditch. I went back in the truck. Total time elapsed outside was maybe five minutes, if that. And to this day, I still feel the frostbite in the tip of my ring finger on my right hand. It was horribly cold. It was just, I mean, I couldn't believe. And my hands, I had frostbite throughout the rest of my hands. Um, but now it's been many years later, and I still have frostbite. I still feel a tinge in the tip of my finger, and I rub it. I can, the, the nerve endings there are, are pretty much dead um, from making the shot. Now, this has been on a lot of magazine covers. It's been published a lot. I've used it in several of my calendars. It's a very made many prints with this photograph. So if if I knew ahead of time that I would lose the feeling in the tip of my ring finger, would I go out and make this photograph? If I knew this is how it was going to look, I guess the answer is absolutely yes. This is a shot that I took many years ago when I was first getting into photography. Um, I was asked by a magazine. The magazine was ma uh, a magazine called Madison Magazine in Madison, Wisconsin. They asked me to start photographing for them, and I guess I didn't know why. But, again, they paid for trips to, like, Packers football games and all these fun things and stuff. And so I was like, plus they paid me. Now, granted, I have a much better paying job than that, but, you know, I, it was kind of neat to have stuff up here in print, so I was happy to do it. On this particular day, I went. there was an outdoor theater in a place called Spring Green where they, every summer, it's like five nights out of the week, they did adult theater where these actors were like flown in from like New York and Los Angeles. And it was a very professional theater troupe. And they would do things, everything from Shakespeare to, oh, you name it, just all kinds of plays. And it was very popular. They sold out every, this, this place would sell out every performance. And so I was making photos for the magazine and it was kind of boring but I got to see the play for free because it was on the dress rehearsal night, which was kind of neat. And, you know, it was kind of boring. And then I, I spun around and I saw this young woman who I found out later is one of the actresses. That's right, Chris. American Players Theater. That's exactly right. I spun around and I saw this woman just staring into the sky. She was about as bored as I was. And uh, I snapped this photograph. And I got home. I mean, what made this photograph was the fact that, number one, I think that she was she had red hair. She was sitting on green seats, and she was wearing blue jeans. And, again, it's not a great photograph, but it's been published a couple times uh, with her permission. But I didn't get her permission until, like, two or three years after I made this photograph. The, the head of the American Players Theater, who runs this facility, contacted me. And she said that she was kind of creeped out that I took this photograph. And I'm like, well, it's a public place. I mean, it isn't like I'm, you know, stalking anyone. I just thought it was a cute, a cute photo op. And so I snapped the photograph. Um, but I talked to her and I said, listen, I, I, you know, I said, I can't use it except in magazines because if without your permission, you know, she's the model in it. I'd have to get a photo release from her. Um, so not to worry about it. And I just, you know, there was nothing nefarious. I just thought it was a cool photograph. And would you like a print? And that seemed to smooth things over. And then two years later, a magazine asked if they could use it. So I contacted her and she said, sure, go ahead. And I actually developed, I wouldn't call it a friendship, but a rapport with her. And so I was able to 
you know, use this photograph. But this is an example, I guess, would be called kind of like street photography, where you candidly take photographs of people who don't know what's going on. And yes, I guess it is a little creepy, but it's a very popular form, art form in America today. This photograph I called Tatanka, which is the, uh, the Sioux word for buffalo. Um, in case you don't know, and I don't want to talk down to you in case you're from Montana, because if you're from Montana, you already know this. But I have people that follow me who don't. Um, buffalo, technically speaking, don't exist in the wild anywhere in the United States anymore. They do ex They are wild in places, in some places in Canada. And when I say buffalo, by the way, yes, I know the technical name for them is bison. Uh, but in Montana, uh, the Native Americans, who prefer to be called Indians, by the way, not Native American or Aboriginal or, or Native peoples, they like to be called Indians. The Indians say um, they prefer to call them buffalo. So I call them what the Indians call them. Um, anyhow... So what happened is, is that they started uh, taking buffalo from Yellowstone, which are kind of wild, but if they leave Yellowstone National Park, they shoot them. So they're not really wild. But they started allowing the Indian reservations in the state of Montana to take small groups of buffalo and raise them. And right now on the Fort Belknap Reservation, as well as I think three other reservations in the state of Montana, they have herds of buffalo that are contained in very large enclosed areas with fencing. Now, the, the ranchers would argue that they are very much wild because it's impossible to keep a buffalo inside of a fenced enclosure. Let me tell you, they look big and they look stupid, but they look like a cow, but they run like a horse. They are extremely dangerous. 20 minutes before I took this photograph, I was on the back of a pickup truck, bouncing along the planes as they were rounding them up because they were testing them for brucellosis and they were culling certain ones from the herd for buffalo meat. And this was, I was out there with Native American, with the Indians of Fort Belknap Reservation, who are members of the, uh, of the uh, Ani and the Nakoda tribes. And I knew the game warden for Fort Belknap, who later became the chief for the Fort Belknap Reservation, we're pretty good friends. And uh, at one point, I asked if I could, the guy I was with, if I could get out of the truck and make some photographs. And he said, sure, and he wasn't thinking. Because little did I realize when you heard buffalo, because the planes are so empty, they'll pick a spot on the horizon and they'll focus on it. Well, I ended up becoming the biggest, boldest spot on the great wide open plains. And this herd of buffalo marching, stampeding, 300 of them or 400 of them, about between probably about 350 of them, turned 90 degrees and come running straight at me. And all of a sudden I realized what was going on. I turned around and I started running, which makes no sense because there was no way I was outrunning them. And the chief, or at the time he was the game warden for the Fort Belknap Reservation, I guess he blared into his radio, and he's a super nice guy, by the way. And all of a sudden, I had all these trucks that were part of this roundup that converged on me and created a wall, a barrier, so that the, the, the buffalo couldn't trample me to death. <laughs> and they turned, and they started going back towards the pen, and they rounded them up. And about five minutes later, they were inside their enclosure, miraculously. I'm not sure how it happened, because rounding up buffalo is much harder than rounding up cows and is much harder than rounding up wild horses. Anyhow, he walked up to me, and he has never shared a negative word with me, and he looked pissed, my friend, and he said to me, two inches from my face, he said, you will never do that again. And I said, no, I won't. I've learned my lesson. So shortly afterwards, um, I was hiding behind a horse trailer as they were letting some animals out. You don't realize this um, behind a horse trailer when they were calling certain buffalo from the herd. And that's where I was hiding as I made this photograph as three of them darted out from their enclosure. It looks like they're running across the plains. And I have people all the time say to me, you know, I can't believe you got that close. And I'll tell them, trust me, I was close. In some ways I was closer than I expected. In other ways I wasn't, you know, I was actually pretty well safe compared to what my antics that I pulled sooner. So 
that's the story behind that photograph now for my last feature which i think will become the most popular feature it's called help i need some photoshop help and it starts with a letter and i get letters every week because you know everybody sends letters right this week my letter comes from r strange name in chicago it says dear todd i have fallen on some hard times recently and i don't have any recent photos of me just having fun can you take a negative photo of me and make it look more positive well r from chicago you're right i absolutely can so here's the photograph he sent of me poor guy doesn't look very happy and so i thought i would help him out by trying to make this look you know a little happier so first thing we're going to do is we're going to use a filter called liquify now this is the filter that uh women uh become self-conscious about because this is what magazines like cosmopolitan and other magazines use to make women look prettier than frankly they appeared in the actual photograph um, so there's something that's kind of dastardly about it but this poor guy he's not looking very happy so i figured you know let's help him with that now remember what i was talking about with the eyes the eyes here they're very sad we're going to make them look less sad here in a little bit but you know making the size the distance of the eyes playing with that a little bit we can make that look a little bit better let's make the eyes look a little bit larger too because it'll make them seem more caring um, and then the nose we don't have to do anything with the nose although because this photograph was taken so close and with a wide angle lens we could probably afford to make the nose a little bit smaller and that's only because not because he has a large nose, it's just because you can tell the lens they use magnifies things that are closer. So poor R from Chicago, we're going to fix that up. Now, can we turn his, his, his frown into a smile? You absolutely can with Photoshop. And all I have to do is take this little notch here and move it to the right. So keep an eye on his mouth. Look at that. He looks a little happier now. And I'll be able to probably do this one more time in a little bit. And then, of course, you know, we got to give him a stiff upper lip because, you know, he look, it's not very firm right now because he's, he's a little sad, okay? And so because he's also maybe, you know, a few years on, oh, you can't see the picture. I'm going to go right back. Okay, hold on. Here we go. This is the photograph. I'm sorry. I should have brought this back to you. This is our... This is R from Chicago. So again, here I made the eyes a little bit bigger and his, his, his smile. You can see I can also make it less, more of a frown. So now I'm going to turn it into a smile. Watch his mouth. And it slowly turns into a smile. Poor guy. And then we're going to make his upper lip, again, a little stiffer. So he started down here. We're going to move it up to the right. And then, you know, we all have had, you know, our faces become a little pudgier with time. So I'm going to decrease his forehead and his hairline. And we're going to increase his, take away his double chin. And we're going to pull in his jawline. And we, we just stripped maybe 10 years off of him. So that's where we're going to start. Look at that. This is where he was. And this is where he is now. Look at that. That alone makes him look. Just look at how much happier he looks. Now, we have to remove the tears from his eyes. Poor guy. We're going to go in here. We're going to grab this healing brush. And we're going to take away the tears under his eyes. We're going to take away the white marks. Any glistening spots. Let's just clean them up. There. Just clean them up. Happy little tears. Just like Bob Ross would say and take him away and then we're going to take away the redness in his eyes and we're going to do that by grabbing the desaturation tool which is a sponge turn it to desaturate and we're going to go in there and we're going to take away the red and the red goes away so he doesn't look so sad now, he's also got some saliva from crying from his mouth. 
I can't believe nobody's figured out who this is yet. I mean, he's been in the news nonstop for the last two days. But anyhow, that's besides the point. And then we cleaned up his eyes. And then, you know, he was also, you know, he's a performer. So let's, uh, let's make it look like he's performing. So let's uh, grab a microphone. We're grabbing the microphone. Actually, I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to grab the whites, the whites, the whites. And I'm going to see. I'm going to inverse. And then I'm going to add this little bit up here. And then I'm going to feather it a little bit. Click OK. Control C. We're going to go back here. Edit paste. One second. We're going to add a microphone here. Edit image size. We're going to take it down to about 800. Control C. We're going to grab this layer. For some reason it's not appearing. We're going to fix that up here in a second. Because first thing we're going to do is we're going to grab his body, make it look like he's at a concert. Back in the old days when he used to sing and get paid for singing. And then we're going to clean this up. We're going to feather it out, shift the edge out, click OK, and then we're going to darken the background. And then we're going to edit free transform. We're going to move the edge in, then we're going to move it in. Some more, and then we're going to hit enter, and then we're going to hit this. Very good. And then you know, every concert you got lights, right? So we're going to now merge these layers. We're going to add some light rays coming in. And we're going to grab B for my brush. Before we do that, we're going to change the uh, softness on this. We're going to feather it out. These light rays aren't firm. And then I'm going to paint a light ray in. Oops. Let me put it on a clean layer. We're going to paint. The right light ray in, we're going to reduce the opacity, select, deselect, and we're going to go back to my microphone now, and we're going to figure out why, there we go. Now we're going to grab this, and this, and we're going to delete, and now we're going to create, increase the slide, the free transform, Link these. Let's take it down to 30%. You. Here's the ray. We're going to merge these. Select, deselect. Edit. Merge layers, edit, select, deselect, edit, free transform. So we're going to take that down here. We're going to twist it so he's got a microphone going to his mouth. We're going to hit enter and we're going to erase this, which I would typically use a mask to get rid of.
there. And then we're going to grab the contours of his hand, get rid of this, and hit delete, select, deselect, and there he is. Mr. R from Chicago. When he had better days. So, next week I hear we have a, a letter coming in from Donald from Washington, D.C. And so we'll work on a different photo then. So, that's it. For the, and I hit almost exactly an hour. That's it for the podcast. That's all I got. If anybody has any questions, they can email me or leave them in the comments. I'll be happy to get to them. Next week, we'll fine-tune some of these things. We'll keep getting better at this. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. And if any of you guys have any ideas for any segments I can host um, to make these a little more interesting, by all means, let me know. I'd be happy to do them. Um, and uh, I guess we'll go from there. So... That's all I got for tonight. This will be uh, edited and chopped up, so it's a little more easy to digest, and will be available sometime in the morning, probably, or in the wee hours of the night. And otherwise, uh, hope to see everybody next Wednesday night. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day. Sit, Ubu, sit. Good cow.